Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 410, uh, featuring a look at the Golden Age game, uh, The Magic Candle. Now this is a game you may or may not have heard of, I get a lot of requests for it, uh, but it's really another one of those sort of uh, hidden gems, I guess, of the uh, late, uh, late 90s, or I'm sorry, uh, late 80s, early 90s, kind of gets uh, slipped under the radar a lot of times. Uh, which is a real shame because it's uh, one of the better uh, Ultima likes. It's got a lot of great bells and whistles. It's uh, a lot more complex and sophisticated than you might think just by glancing at it. Uh, so I thought it'd be well worth the time to really sort of dig into it and uh, see what it was all about. Uh, I've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is the Magic Candle. And here we go, folks, with the Magic Candle, uh, version 1.7. And this is a game that's been highly requested here at Matt Shed. I've gotten numerous requests for this over the years. I think the most recent was from a uh, YouTuber by the name of President Snow. <laughs> so, uh, so there you go. Uh, the president himself requesting uh, this game. Not sure what he's president of, but anyway. Uh, this is a uh, really an overlooked gem, in my opinion. It gets sort of lumped in, and people just say, well, it's just another Ultima clone. I think that's really unfair. Uh, yeah, it looks a lot like Ultima, but once you get into this, I, I think you'll see it's, it's quite a bit different. It definitely, it definitely doesn't feel uh, like an Ultima game. Uh, usually what I like to do in, in my book, in, in those cases, instead of saying something's a clone, like an Ultima clone, uh, I would say something like it's an Ultima-like, you know, like the rogue, rogue-likes or the Diablo-likes. Uh, you know, you can use the same sort of setup, uh, but have a very different kind of game. I don't think anybody would try to say that the, uh, you know, something like Dungeon Siege is is ex <laughs> just a shameless ripoff of Diablo. I mean, give me a break. Uh, but anyway, this game definitely has its uh, similarities. Uh, came out on the Apple II, uh, although uh, the uh, designer did do some other versions. There's ports of this for the. I'll show you later in the video. We got the Commodore 64 version. And we've got the uh, IBM Tandy version, or the DOS version. Uh, that one was uh, programmed by uh, James Thomas. But the main uh, designer here uh, behind the Magic Candle is one uh, Ali in Adebek. As far as I can tell, he's from Turkey. And all the stuff I read about him, it's kind of hard to find information, actually, but I, I came across some, some forums where people were talking about him. And I remember one of the posts that really stood out to me was uh, this guy just called him up one time, asking him some questions about the game. And he got his home number. And he's like, the guy was just so friendly and excited to talk about the game. Uh, you know, not upset at all that he's getting interrupted. You know, nothing like that. He just seemed like a really uh, cheerful, you know, uh, fun character to get to know. And I'd like to get him on uh, Matt Chat. That'll be my... <laughs> it's been a while since I've done an interview. Uh, but he's one. He's a guy I've been wanting to chat with for a very long time. So if anybody knows how to get in touch with him, you know, I've tried all the usual means. <laughs> I should just look him up in the phone book. <laughs> uh, pretty, I'm not sure where he lives, but uh, maybe try to find him that way. Uh, but anyway, uh, he, there's this one. There's a sequel. Uh, I think two sequels. There's a, I want to say a spinoff. But we're just going to look here at the first game uh, in this video. <laughs> now, honestly, I mean, it does... Start off kind of like an ultimate. Uh, we're in the, in the throne room and summoned by the king. Uh, he's going to give us our quest. And it's uh, it's kind of an involved quest. And I'll see if I can uh, get the manual pulled up here. Because there's a lot a lot in the manual that's not spelled out in the game. Uh, but the basic idea is that there's this uh, demon, Dreax, I think is how you pronounce this. And he's trapped in this flame of the magic candle. And there's usually guardians around that candle, but they've all disappeared and we're playing this uh, ranger named Lucas, who's uh, responding to the summons to, you know, put together a band of adventurers and, and figure out what to do about this uh, situation. So, uh, you know, it's a fairly uh, different sort of backstory. You know, it's not the usual uh, kill the evil wizard or, uh, you know, <laughs> fetch the orb. You know, a little bit more involved and uh, kind of gives you a nice uh, plot device to work with, right? This candle slowly burning down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, puts a little more pressure on you. That'd be a good uh, movie device, I think. Uh, 
Uh, but anyway, once we get that done, uh, a lot of this initial part will just be uh, talking to people, gathering rumors. It's a lot like the Ultima series in that regard. It's one of, another one of those where you want to talk to everybody, <laughs> get as much advice, get as, all the rumors, uh, keep careful notes. It does have a map uh, that I'll show you here later in the video, but uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to you know kind of sketch out a, a little map either. Uh, although I didn't find it as, in, as hard to get around this as I did some of the other, ga other games I've played on this channel over the years. Uh, but we only get to, uh, you know, make our first character Lucas, but we'll soon have a whole party of characters. And one of the more interesting parts of this game is that there's a lot of options here to split up the party. And you can have very different kinds of party members doing different things at different times and different places. Uh, so you could hire a, a tailor and just put him at work in a town uh, tailoring, you know, bringing in some, some gold for the party. Uh, there's carpenters, there's uh, <laughs> metal workers. Uh, and one of the really interesting things when we uh, go to the camp, you'll see, and if you remember in Pool of Radiance, you just camped, uh, you rested, and you might get interrupted. You know, it wasn't much else to it. You had your uh, mages memorizing spells and maybe healing up and uh, things of that sort. Uh, but this game really uh, gets complicated. You know, you can you can just post somebody <laughs> to watch. Uh, you can have other people hunting. Uh, you can have uh, people uh, fixing armor. Uh, there's just uh, all kinds of little. Uh, tasks you can assign in addition to sleeping and it really uh, is a re more recent game like that i was playing that was uh, i think it's called vikings and there was another one about um uh, like the spanish conquest <laughs> the conquistador era <laughs> uh, that sort of had that set up so you do see it in a in later games i don't know if this was if um, ali was the or adebeck was the first one to come up with it uh, or not but you know you don't find that too often uh, just looking at my, my options here. It's, it's a lot of fun. It, it, this kind of reminds me of the, the interview. <laughs> like I'm interviewing possible uh, companions here so I can talk to them, uh, see if I like the cut of their jib. Uh, I like the fact, I like a game where the uh, NPCs <laughs> want to be part of your group. You know, I hate it when you have to kind of beg or pester them or, or bribe them. Uh, it just doesn't feel right, feel right to me. And I'd rather play with people that uh, want to play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, please take me like the Might Magic Six. I love that sort of thing. Anyway, let's see. We've got plenty of characters there. This is, um, I believe there's another place later on where we can get more characters. And if they die, I guess you could come back and get some more or, or try to resurrect them. Uh, there's a little bit to know here. Uh, the uh, There's different kinds of books that the wizards will have, and those will have different spells in them. Uh, so one of these wizards has one that will uh, let you resurrect people. And the other one, I think, might have uh, like a sleep spell and a chaos spell. But that's one of the reasons why you want to have the uh, the manual handy. Uh, but then again, uh, you might just like experimenting. You know, trying out different parties. <laughs> you know, get some of the more unusual classes in there. Uh, it can be fun to play around with. I think it's kind of interesting here that wizard is a race. You know, if you look at that, uh, wizard mage, I don't, I don't know if the wizard race can be other things or not. Just looking here at the manual, it seems like he's got more of the, uh, somebody like Gandalf in mind, right? They, uh, this ancient race, uh, they look like, pe they look like men or, or people, <laughs> humans, uh, but they are long lived and you don't even, they don't even know when, when they were born. Um, <laughs> this manual something else. There's all the little extra, little quotes in there. Uh, from different characters in the game. There's one here from about uh, Wizards from Prince Nethian. It says, Although pointed ears are essential to civilized behavior, they have nothing to do with the origin of the wizards. I am afraid that there are some things that the race of man was simply not meant to know. Uh, so you definitely want to get a hold of this manual yeah, if you play this, because it's just, uh, it's really well written, and there's lots of fun little tidbits in there uh, that, of course, uh, won't be in the, the game itself. And another thing about this is, since you are talking to people uh, so much, you put in this charisma thing, uh, like you've seen that in plenty of other games, right, where they won't talk to you if your charisma's too low. Uh, and some of these characters have more charisma than others, and also the profession uh, plays a role in that. Like here's the, again, looking at the manual, the tailor. A brave little tailor may seem an unlikely choice to help save Druvia from the powers of darkness. Uh, true, they'll be of little use while fighting goblins. But a good tailor can get a high-paying job, and more importantly, can talk to anyone. A nervous Deruvian who might swallow his own tongue when approached by a scar-faced fighter 
will be happy to carry on a long, relaxed conversation with a humble tailor. And I think the halflings uh, even have uh, uh, more charisma than that. Uh, let's see what it says about them. Yeah, halflings are excellent conversationalists. They tell interesting stories and listen very attentively, <laughs> uh, especially over a hearty meal. Uh, so there's a lot of different aspects to this game besides uh, just how you know well they can swing a sword. <laughs> so, you know, I like that. Uh, it adds a, a certain depth to the game, makes it feel more uh, well-rounded somehow. Okay, so we got our party put together, looks like. Got the interviewing done. Guess I should probably run this by HR first. It's like we got <laughs> predominantly white candidates here. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, I think we got a pretty good mix of the different uh, races and classes here. And uh, I tried to pick some that would be good for the, uh, you know, other skills. Uh, like the carpenter, for example, is supposed to be good for camping. Help out your camping somehow. Okay. Uh, now, like the... Uh, I guess sort of like the gold box games. You sort of have a system like that for your mages. Uh, they have to recall a spell uh, before they can cast it. And they can only learn a spell if they find the uh, the book uh, where the spells are located. And uh, then the, you've only got so many uses there before you have to uh, recall them again. Uh, but the, one of the nice things about this is that once you do recall a spell, you can use them all if you just keep going back to back. I think it says here you can go up to, up to 99. Of course, that probably won't be too likely because you'll run out of energy you know, every time you cast a spell. It seemed like I could only cast maybe two or three times before I would run out of energy. Well, it's a good thing to keep in mind, you know, if you if you wait until you're in combat, then you might lose a, a round having to recall. It's kind of like, kind of like uh, readying a weapon, it uh, seems like to me. So if you go ahead and recall the one that you want to cast now, <laughs> once you get into combat, uh, hopefully you won't have to lose that uh, round there. Uh, just in, looking at these spells, too, I'll show you. Uh, what they do. So this is the book. Uh, this is the book of Sabano, which is the book of conflict. So fear, you probably, probably guess what that does? Uh, confuse, repel, uh, locate. Is kind of, was kind of interesting. That one is uh, you become aware of all the forces of darkness in the area, and you can only use that outdoors. And so that would be great if you're trying to avoid a, an encounter. Maybe your party's damaged, wounded, and you're trying to get back. And then assess is to give you information about your enemy strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so there's quite a bit to this game. Again, it might look a little simple on the surface, but you can really dig into this. And that's just uh, one of the spell books. And there's, I think, uh, two other, or three, yeah, two others there at the beginning. And you can get this uh, uh, the sort of secret one, the Book of Zaxxon. They call it the Book of Something. And all the spells start with Z. Uh, so uh, quite a bit uh, to get into here. All right, anyway, the first part of the game is mostly just uh, wandering around this castle. Uh, we put our party together. We uh, try to talk to as many people as we can, take notes. Um, <laughs> you know, nowadays you'd probably just want to uh, look at a clue book uh, to save yourself uh, some time. But uh, you notice there, each character, we have this. You could ask advice. Uh, we can ask for uh, uh, about rumors that they've heard. Or you can just type in a keyword. And of course, that opens up uh, <laughs> you know, basically unlimited possibilities. Now, I tried a few uh, just basic things. Uh, talking to them didn't seem to work. So it does seem pretty particular. Uh, like this one. Ask Trickerviz trick about pearls. Uh, so you probably had to type in pearls. and uh, Just pearls. Yeah, don't try to get fancy <laughs> uh, when you run into that other character. And you'll get another bit of advice. Uh Another thing I like about the game, if we look around at this interface here, I mean, he's got quite a bit of information displayed here. And it's, what I really like is it's very obvious <laughs> what it does, <laughs> what it's for. You don't have to look in the manual to try to figure out, like, what is this? What is that? And we've got our party configuration there. Uh, we, it tells us we're on the second level of this castle. We've got the time uh, above. And it does take into consideration night and day. And uh, so if it's, if it's uh, nighttime, you can't get into the shops. Uh, for example, uh, so it's got that sort of mechanic. A thousand days, that's how long we have until that candle burns out. Uh, we've got that lovely on-screen compass. Ugh, love a compass. <laughs> even though, even though, to be honest with you, it's not really necessary on a game 
like this, <laughs> you know, it's just up left and right. I mean, I could figure it out to be. It's, usually, that's more handier if you have a uh, in a first person game. Uh, but I guess it doesn't hurt. Maybe there's some way you can get turned around in this. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I love the fact, too, that it tells us what room we're in, uh, the throne room. And then we've got a nice little display of our uh, six characters along the side. There's their status. Uh, the strength, uh, that's basically their hit points. And th those will go down once we're in battle. And then the energy, uh, that covers a lot of stuff. You know, their the movement, uh, cast spells, uh, uh, certain tasks will wear that down. And you'll have to uh, rest back up. Uh, so the graphically, uh, I think it looks great, you know, for the, especially for this era on the, uh, era on the Apple II. Uh, very tidy. Uh, another nice touch is you can always figure out what does what, just the first name or first letter of everything. It puts the whole menu out there for you. Uh, yeah, I keep messing around here uh, with this uh, recall spell. I didn't realize how it worked. <laughs> it took me a little while to kind of wrap my head around this. Uh, uh, you know, you play enough of these games, you can get them confused with each other. Uh, but for this one, if you remember those D&D &D games, you'd have to go to camp and you'd have to, uh, if you had the spell scribed in your spell book, then you had to memorize it. And that would take some time, uh, some quiet time. Uh, in this one, it's sort of similar to that. Uh, once you've learned the spell, once it's in your spell book, you can, uh, once, you're, once you're in camp, you can just keep learning it uh, over and over and over again until you get up to 99, uh, apparently, is, is the maximum on that. And then when you're in battle, you just recall it or basically ready that spell and you can start casting it until you run out of energy. Uh, so that's the system. And then the, uh, I guess you could find other books later on where you could learn spells from these other books. Uh, so it's fairly straightforward. It just takes a little getting uh, used to. And then while I'm thinking about it, let me show you how to, to split up the party. Uh, so one thing that you could do is have, uh, as your wizards are learning their spells, uh, you can break up the party in, into two uh, sections here. I don't know if you can do more than two. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, and what that lets us do, we can just put the wizards in the camp, let them do their thing, uh, while everybody else is off exploring the castle or, or whatever. It is the same thing if you wanted to have somebody work as a tailor uh, or whatever. So that's a pretty cool innovation here. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, skip forward a bit and get on out into the uh, wilderness and hopefully get into some combat. Uh, we got plenty of uh, encounters we'll meet along the road. There's merchants with all kinds of weird items. Uh, this guy sells magical pyramids. Uh, so not really sure what these do. Yeah, it might be spelled out somewhere in the manual, but uh, it probably wouldn't hurt just to have that. <laughs> it says, ask about gems to traveling dwarves. So, uh, there we go. Using my halfling there because he's got a lot of uh, charisma. He's not intimidating, I suppose. Let's see. He doesn't even know what his own pyramids do, apparently. Anyway, back to the scene. Uh, we'll probably have to get off this trail if we want to get into combat, that's my guess. But uh, we'll see what happens here. we got a nice little village over there to the left. Go ahead and explore that. Yeah, it's, an, it's an attractive map. That looks good. I like the uh, gates closed. Okay, so <laughs> it's dark. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to have to uh, kill some time here somehow uh, before it gets these gates open. There we go. And so what is it, about uh, 10, 20 minutes per step? Another nice thing is we can select whichever character we want to be our active party member. And I guess you had to carefully space out every area to make sure that you could have these uh, three people abreast uh, to fit through all the little places they need to fit in. Let's see, what do we have here? Uh, welcome to my humble shop, gracious sir. All right, so here's our merchant. Should be able to buy some stuff. Ganchi, Mirjit, Luffin, Loka, Pearl. Wow, yeah, so none of this stuff will probably... Uh, you won't know what most of this stuff does unless you've read the manual. Let's just look up one of them here. What is Ganchi? Let's see. Uh, Ganchi mushrooms before or during combat would give you a burst of magical dexterity. When next you act, you will accomplish three times as much as a person of normal dexterity. Uh, the sermon mushrooms are for restoring energy. Uh, Drelin mushrooms increase traveling speed. Uh, so again, all this is in the manual, so it would definitely be nice to have that open 
as you're playing this because there's not a lot of uh, info in the game. I should mention something else, too, that kind of got me with this. Um, there's a copy protection system here. It lets you create a new party. And this actually, this is pretty clever. Uh, so it lets you create a new party, adventure all you want. But then when you come back later, you want to reload and, and keep playing. Uh, then it'll ask you for a password, you know, a certain word from the manual, like page 34, column, whatever. Uh, and, of course, if you don't know it, you won't be able to load your game. I thought that was pretty clever, you know, because somebody might get into this, create a new party, you know, play it all day with a pirated copy and then figure out, uh, uh oh, <laughs> I can't reload <laughs> uh, and just now figure that out and then have no choice but to run to the uh, to the uh, what was the name of that um, uh, software store back in the day? Uh, God, I can't even think of Electronics Boutique. There we go. Uh, run to the local electronics boutique and uh, pick up a copy of this game so they could continue. Uh, so that one even got me uh, by surprise. And I got online looking for, like, lists of, uh, you know, those passwords. I couldn't find it. And the manual I found, this PDF manual, doesn't have page numbers on it. So I guess you could probably figure that out somehow. But it's just kind of neat to me how an old copy protection system like that is still working uh, all these years later. Okay, so what do we got here? Uh, just exploring this town, trying to decide how to spend my money. And again, it's that old question of, do you want to upgrade weapons? Do you want better armor? Do you want... And it even factors in how long it takes to make. Uh, so even if I were to buy some armor, uh, I might have to come back in a couple days because it takes them a while to, uh, to make it <laughs> to fit. <laughs> uh, so that's a kind of startling realism uh, for games of this era, right? That they would... Uh, you know, most games and pretend like, yeah, just any old set of plate mail would fit anybody. Uh, here, I guess they're factoring in that yeah, they'd have to measure you and that plate would have to be a certain size and uh, it wouldn't fit the dwarf. Uh, same, you know, for the human, it wouldn't fit the dwarf and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's kind of cool. And so there's all kinds of little uh, details like that throughout the game. And I guess some of this is probably in other games but uh oh they also have a, a system for stuff wearing out which i guess is all the more reason to have one of those metal smiths in your party and fix up your stuff for you and so yeah quite a bit to it it really is anyway i'm ready to get into some combat so it's <laughs> as much fun as it is to hang out in this tavern uh let's get out and see what kind of trouble we can get ourselves into all right, I'm out in the countryside, and I got an encounter. Remember, there is a spell that I can cast that would have shown those uh, encounters around the map. I didn't choose to use it, but that, that is available. That's that locate spell. All right, so in our initial combat phase here, I can uh, position my troops, go ahead and draw weapons, uh, decide what maybe it's a spell cast or what spell I want to have uh, recalled or ready to cast, and... Uh, then you can just begin the combat. You can't move it anywhere you want. I mean, there are limits here. Uh, but this gives you a little bit of strategy. Uh, one of the things about this game is uh, you can't attack diagonally. At least I couldn't figure it out. If that's possible, I don't know how to do it. Uh, so you have to put some thought into that. You know, these troops are going to be advancing. Uh, you don't want to get surrounded. <laughs> you want to surround them, not vice versa. Uh, you do need to draw the weapon and then try to get into position. That guy's got a scimitar. And this guy has a bow. Uh, the cool thing about a bow, of course, is it's a ranged attack. And if you position it right, even if you miss one of the one of the dudes, uh, it'll hit the guy behind him. Or even the, the guy three, uh, three ranks back. Uh, so you want to think about how you're positioning that archer. I think it's better if you've got a, a line of people. And that way you won't miss. You at least hit the one behind him. Um, now, I kind of messed up here at the beginning. I didn't put all my guys out in the front. I just accidentally began uh, before I was ready. <laughs> Poor old Luke is out there by himself. Uh, I really should have had these guys in a better position. Uh, however, we can use our bow. So check that out. Boom. <laughs> Hit him for uh, 12 points. Or, yeah, negative 12 points. What's to say? There's stamina 10. Uh, so that archer is a very nice... Uh, addition to the party. Might even want to have a couple of those rangers. Let's try the spell. Uh, boom! Orc shrinks in fear for six turns. Uh, so there we go. A little debuff. Now if you look over there though, it took a lot of energy to cast that spell. 
Uh, so you really want, you probably want to really think about which one you want to uh, cast it on. You know, who's going to be the biggest problem for you. And we also want to keep an eye on that strength, of course. ST, I think that might be stamina instead of strength. But <laughs> anyway, uh, you don't want that to get too low because then our, uh, uh, we'll die. I have to get the character resurrected. And so our wizard here is already, uh, energy is too low already. Uh, so I guess he's, let's try to take a, uh, one of these mushrooms, see what that does. Okay, so that moved him back up to 99. That's cool. Of course, also, I guess, you know, if you got so many spells memorized, it's not that big of a deal. But uh, if you've only got three or four uh, spells uh, learned, you want to think again judiciously about that, keeping in mind, too, how long it's going to take to relearn them. And there we go. I got one guy, uh, one orc is dead there, lying down. Uh, one of the more interesting things I thought about this game, I'm not sure what I, if I like this or not, but uh, there's no way to just automatically collect all the loot once you're done with a battle. You have to go from corpse to corpse and search it. Uh, that to me is probably not the best <laughs> design. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little tedious. I guess it is more realistic in a way, but, uh, you know, I didn't really see... wasn't that much fun to go around and, and have to do that. Um... Otherwise, though, it moves at a pretty quick pace. I am missing a lot, but uh, they're also missing me a lot, so it's all right. I guess uh, that those skills will pick up. And something else, I don't know if it's going to show up here, uh, but I was noticing every now and then I would it would say something like short sword plus one, uh, bow skill you know, plus one, magic plus one. So it's kind of leveling up these skills uh, as I use them, which I always like that sort of thing. Uh, of course, you can also take them to trainers to learn those th uh, skills as well, but that will take time. Uh, but other than, otherwise, it's pretty straightforward stuff. You know, I'm glad that I don't have to keep pressing attack and pointing. I can just sort of walk into them and automatically do the attack. And one thing I'm kind of curious about, I'd like to talk to Ali about, since this came out after the Gold Box game, or at least uh, Pool of Radiance, I don't know to what extent he would have been influenced by that, or maybe Wizard's Castle. And, you know, surely he played some of those. And this wasn't his first game either. He did one called Rings of Zilf Zilfen uh, before this. I talked about it a little bit in the uh, Dungeons and Desktops book. Uh, but anyway, it's always interesting to see what uh, people take of a system, what they decide is uh, just sort of uh, can't be changed or has to stay the same and what you can play around with. You know, what are the variables between these uh, Ultima likes? Uh, obviously, we're doing the whole Ultima 3 thing here with the uh, split mode for combat but it plays well you know there's no question I, I i can easily see myself getting sucked into this you, know, you do have all these characters here to uh, to level up to, and to gear up and a big <laughs> world to explore uh, interesting uh, mission to go on so yeah quite a bit here to keep you occupied all right let's see if i can kill this final orc and uh we can mop up the treasure and I think after that I'll show you some of the other versions and you can decide which one you'd like to play. I'm not going to bother this time with the uh, the Japanese exports because uh, they really just, to me, it's they just, they're just they different games. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you can take a look at the screenshots if you like, but I'll show you the 60, Commodore 64 version and then the DOS version. Now, this is one other thing I'll say that's interesting about this is that you, you're taking different characters around to loot the corpses. Uh, so I don't know if he was thinking maybe you'd have some buddies over and they would be sort of responsible for the different characters. So you might say, okay, well, it's my turn to loot a corpse. It's my turn to loot a corpse. So you might want to uh, role play that. Uh, of course, later there's options. You could pull the gold, distribute it uh, amongst the party members. So uh, quite a bit. I'll just, let me just show you this too. Uh, so I'm just showing you how the, uh, the sleep mode works or the camping mode. So you could just have everybody sleep which would be pretty dumb because then you could get ambushed. Uh, and that just means it gets uh, to move and before you do. Uh, or you can uh, do all sorts of other stuff, learn spells, uh, hunt. Uh, if you got a spell book, you can learn from that. Uh, you can pack up and leave, uh, fix gear, eat. <laughs> and the rest of it is, I guess, pretty uh, self-explanatory. Uh, I thought this was a pretty cool system. Uh, I like that. I like the little extra dimension. And uh, it was fun. Anyway, let's uh, move on. I'll show you the Commodore 64 version. 
All right, so there you, you can clearly see it looks different. Um, maybe a little bit more colorful, a little bit better color, color palette maybe. Uh, some stuff is different, not necessarily better or worse. Uh, just looking around, the interface looks pretty much the same. You kind of have to look closely. I guess a little subtle differences there maybe. Uh, just as far as gameplay, it just felt uh, identical to me. Uh, one problem with this emulator, <laughs> you know, the uh, it's emulating the loading times, and I don't know how accurate this is, but uh, but man, this, these were some long loads. Uh, so I would probably shy away from this version <laughs> uh, unless uh, you found a way to speed up the the loading uh, on the emulator. Uh, but I guess if you like that C64 look, uh, you might prefer this. I'll just go ahead and advance it so you can see the combat, compare that. All right, so there you go. Let's go ahead and uh, camp out and just put everybody to sleep so we can just get to a combat. <laughs> this is not smart gameplay. <laughs> Ahmad. Ahmad is hungry. Oh, God. Ahmad. There we go. Ambush. Again, yeah, we're going to be dealing with a little bit of a loading time. We'll see how bad it is. I might skip the video here. Oh, there we go. Oh, no, not too bad. Oh, so we got our orcs there. You can see they look a little bit more. You got a little bit more detail on them, I suppose. You can see, sort of see their snouts. <laughs> you know, one thing that, that did disappoint me. <laughs> I don't know if you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's no rats in this. I mean, he's got a pretty good list of uh, monsters, different kinds, but... Uh, no rats. He's got uh, them divided into categories here based on, I guess, their combat style. So you got the soldiers. It's kind of self-explanatory. The beasts. Uh, God, you know, I could have squeezed in a rat there. <laughs> He's got slimes. <laughs> a Fermigon. Uh, you recognize a Fermigon when you see one. His mouth is bigger than his stomach and bigger than any other part of his body. Uh, he's got archer monsters. They throw things at you. You know, distance attackers. And then thaumaturges. I guess that's how you pronounce that. Uh, those range from death knights to hazriels, games, dreads, gargons. I'm not sure if he's if he's got a mythology that he's pulling some of these from. I haven't heard of some of these uh, these creatures before. Hiblis. Hiblis. Uh, Hiblis worked their evil magic. They created them. Mongors and the Firmigons and train the Jeraz. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he, I, he looks like he's got quite a bit of lore. Put some thought in these monsters. You know, it's not just this, the typical, you know, monsters you've seen over and over again. Raffles. <laughs> uh, some of them are the, like gnolls, trolls, goblins, sure. Uh, so, anyway, it's an interesting uh, uh, collection there of uh, monsters to fight. Uh, but anyway, just coming back to this uh, Commodore 64 version, you know, this looks like a fine game. If I'd have had this back in the day, I would have played the hell out of it. Uh, unfortunately, I did not have this game on the C64. I always like to hear from people that, that did. Uh, you know, did this game stand out? How much did you play this? Etc. Uh, but let's move on to the, uh, the last one here, the DOS version, which I think is probably the best of the bunch. Uh, so yeah, you can already tell this. It's quite a bit better graphics. I think I mentioned that this was the took advantage of the Tandy. Uh, so back in the day, I think Tandy was. Uh, I forget. I mean, should, probably should know this stuff, but I'm pretty sure Tandy had better graphics than the uh, IBM PCs for a while. It was based on the uh, IBM PC Junior, and they had better luck with it. Of course, later on you had the VGA and all that stuff and eclipsed it. But you know, there was a little space in there where the uh, the best looking one would have been the Tandy version. I think you see that here. I mean, this looks better than a lot of the DOS games from this uh, period. Uh, very colorful. I like the little added details. It's amazing what just a little bit more resolution gets you. <laughs> just, a, uh, just a few extra colors, you know, if you, if you use them well. Uh, it really makes a difference. Uh, but I don't think it's any different in terms of the uh, interface or game mechanics or anything. Uh, you know, I don't know that for sure. There could be some subtle differences in here. Uh, but it certainly feels the same to me. Uh, I just got to say, just being able to tell my characters apart better, I think that would be, if nothing else, a reason to play this. I'm just going to look up and see who did this version. All right, it's one Jason 
No, I'm sorry, James B. Thomas. Let's see, what else did he do? Oh, so he was with them the whole time. He did all the other magic candles. Uh, looks like he worked on Bloodstone. That's another game in the series, Siege. So I guess they must have been pretty good friends because it looks like they did a lot of work together. And uh, on the C64 version, that was... Oh, I have some more information here. This is cool. Uh, so IBM CGA graphics and then the Tandy 1000 computer graphics were by James uh, Thomas, who I just mentioned, Anthony po Postma. Not sure who that is. Uh, but then there's a guy listed here called Uger Adebeck. U-G-U-R Adebeck. So I'm wondering if that's that's probably his uh, some relation, I guess, to Ali. Uh, so that's kind of cool. I wonder if this guy was like the artist. Yeah, he even did the some of the box designs. Now, so he must have been a really talented artist because the uh, you know these boxes look great. Uh, so I think this will do it for the magic candle. Uh, I'd love to hear from you if you're a big fan of this series, if you think the first one's the best, or if you like the second or third, or uh, some of the stuff that they got up to uh, after this. You know, again, it is, it's not a series you come across a lot. Uh, even people that were big CRPG fans might have uh, missed this one. It probably didn't help that it was, I think it was uh, published by, uh, was it Minecraft? Or, oh, I don't know what to call that. Uh, yeah, Minecraft Software don't know a lot about that company they didn't do a whole lot of games looks like you know based out of Torrance California uh, and then even uh, Adebeck he went on to do the siege game and when was this uh, 1992 which I've had uh, people actually request that one before too also by this Minecraft uh, but obviously this is not going to have the hype of uh, something published by Electronic Arts or SSI or um, and, of course, Origin, which was pretty much the brand, the name uh, in the industry back then. Uh, but anyway, I think it's kind of a shame. You know, especially if you do like that Ultima style, uh, if you like the tactical combat, if you like the uh, idea of the uh, extra strategic uh, considerations here around camping and all of that, I think you'd really like this game. Uh, so anyway, let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'll try to be back with a new episode as uh, soon as possible, though I have to tell you, I've got the uh, semester creeping up on me. It always does that. And I'll probably you know, be a couple of weeks trying to get ready for that. Uh, so I'll try to get a new episode out as soon as possible. But uh, again, if there's a bit of a delay there, you'll know uh, it's just me doing uh, <laughs> you know, my real job. Uh, so that can kind of get in the way sometimes. It's funny how that happens. Uh, but anyway, I really, truly appreciate your support for keeping uh, Matt Chat on the air all these years. Could not do it without you for a second. Totally, uh, totally uh, depend on you and your help, and I really, really appreciate it. I <laughs> have no idea. Uh, if you uh, would like to uh, support the show, haven't done that yet, uh, lots of things you could do. Uh, best thing is go to that Patreon site, sign up to be a, a Ratreon, keep the show going. A buck a show, that's all I ask uh, uh, to do these episodes. Uh, I do uh, appreciate that. Uh, also, if you tell other people about the show, uh, share it on your Facebook, uh, uh, your Twitter accounts, or whatever it is, I really appreciate it. And also, I need to mention again, uh, uh, these Matt Chat coins, these are, uh, I think they're still for sale on eBay, uh, but these are really going a lot faster than I thought, uh, which is great for me, I guess, but, uh, you know, some people are buying like three or four of these at a pop, so if you want one of those coins and you haven't done it yet, uh, you probably uh, want to head on over there and, and pick one of those up, or two or three or <laughs> whatever. Uh, I just don't want you to be disappointed if you don't get one, uh, because I, I'm not going to, uh, you know, make any more of those once they're gone they're gone so enjoy uh, all right what about that news from the Met cave well got quite a bit of great news i mean what a hell of a <laughs> uh, where to even get started? I, I guess I'll just get started with the Wajidai. Uh, their unavowed game. I think I might have mentioned this uh, a couple weeks ago. 
Uh, but anyway, it's been getting a lot of traction. You know, this thing is doing a really, really well. I'm really happy there for Dave. You know, I had him on the show. Great guest, great guy. And it's just great to see these a point-and-click uh, adventure game getting this kind of uh, coverage. Uh, but anyway, if you haven't heard of this before, I'll just uh, read you a quick summary. Uh, so a demon possessed you one year ago. Uh, since that day, you unwillingly tore a trail of bloodshed through New York City. Your salvation comes in the form of the unavowed and ancient society dedicated to stopping evil. Uh, so if that sounds good to you, go check this out. I'll uh, post a link to it. Uh, but uh, really, congratulations uh, to Dave and, and to uh, Wajidai. Uh, really good to see that uh, happening for you. Uh, and then Adam uh, sent in a couple of uh, cool things. Uh, one is this uh, podcast he did, Fragments of Silicon, with Harris Foster, Andrew Shouldis. Shouldis? Uh, Shouldis? Not quite sure on the <laughs> pronunciation. Uh, but anyway, they uh, have done a game called uh, Tunic uh, with a cute fox. Kind of action-adventure thing. But uh, I thought it was interesting just for the look of this thing. If you look here, looking at these uh, screenshots, it's, it's really got uh, an interesting look, aesthetic to it. And I thought you might find that interesting. Uh, you can hear about, uh, hear from the creators of that, a little bit of artistic discussion. Uh, and then he also wrote in about this. It's a Kickstarter for a game called Mini, or Minsky's Furballs. And a really interesting project here. Uh, so it's a game that was completed but never released uh, uh, back in the day. It's a big box game. And they are trying to uh, pu basically publish this thing uh, for PC, Mac, and Amiga. Uh, with the uh, good old big box style. So it'd be a great collector item. And it's uh, the game is a puzzle game. It's similar, they say, to Tetris Attack on the, on the on, uh, SNES or Street Fighter Puzzle Fighter uh, on the PS1. And they say it was originally developed and released for the Amiga. Uh, however, it was never released for the CDTV and CD32. Uh, so, <laughs> so it was released for the Amiga 500, 600, 1200, but the... Uh, the one for the CD TV, uh, CD TV and CD32 never came out. And it was supposed to be out on DOS, but again, uh, something happened there. It was canceled. And so they got the rights to it. Uh, they're going to re-release it, republish it for all those systems. Uh, so if that interests you, head over there to the link on, on that Kickstarter page and check it out. Uh, Shane wrote in uh, about this game. This is uh, Green, Green Ronin Publishing and Drowning Monkeys. Uh, proud to announce the first CRPG set in the uh, Freeport City of Adventure. And I was reading about this, and it's, it's a really interesting project they've got going here. It's uh, a little different than the typical uh, CRPG. I'll just uh, read their description here. Uh, you play in a virtual room hosted by a virtual game master whose voice promises to be familiar to tabletop fans everywhere on a virtual table. And they've really uh, tried to recreate that tabletop experience, dice throws, playing with friends, painting miniatures, <laughs> uh, character sheets, all of that. And uh, this uh, Freeport, if you're not familiar with that, uh, that's a campaign setting uh, with uh, uh, classic fanny, uh, classic fantasy, classic fanny elements. <laughs> there we go. Uh, classic fantasy elements with pirates and Lovecraftian uh, horror. So quite a nice little cocktail there. Go check that out. That's uh, uh, Freeport, the City of Adventure Kickstarter. And then good old Stig, you know, he's always got to put his uh, news items in here. I'm glad he does that. <laughs> uh, he's always got some interesting items. Sometimes I just post them on my uh, Matt Chat Facebook page. Uh, but this one uh, I thought for sure needed to be mentioned on here. This is a Phantom Doctrine, a strategic turn-based espionage thriller uh, set in the peak of the Cold War. You know, it seems like we're getting a number of these Cold War games now. It's kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, draws on a wide variety of influences. We've got classic spy films. Uh, the game thrusts the player into the mysterious world of covert operations, counterintelligence, conspiracy, and paranoia. <laughs> hopefully, then this hopefully this will turn out better than Alpha Protocol did. It seems like it's covering a lot of the same territory. Uh, but anyway, take a look at the screenshots. I was really kind of impressed with this. Uh, uh, what they call it, the murder board or the tactical? I don't know what they exactly what that's called, but uh, it reminds me a lot of uh, the you know big fan of the uh, murder mystery shows on TV. I uh, watch a lot of those, uh, so it seems like it's got some of those elements in there. You know, as well as, uh, you know, let's see what else they uh, mentioned there. Uh, you know, I should mention this. Next generation turn-based combat uh, offers unprecedented flexibility of movement and actions, including uh, overwatch modes and, and breach ability. Uh, but anyway, it looks to me, you know, maybe I'm not looking into this deeply enough, but it looks kind of like it's got a nice uh, dose of uh, uh, adventure 
uh, element game elements into this, uh, which if they're able to pull this off, I think it'll be really good. Uh, but anyway, that's Phantom Doctrine. Check that out. And then uh, finally, the Bard's Tale Trilogy is out today. Uh, now, you, you know, we've been talking about this off and on. I'm not going to get into the, <laughs> the behind-the-scenes uh, shenanigans on this. But anyway, uh, they've uh, taken those first three games and, you know, updated the graphics, uh, the interface. They put in an auto map. Uh, you got all kinds of uh, other quality of life enhancements they're talking about. Apparently did a really good job on that. Uh, the reviews are really positive for it. Now, I should note that you can get, if you, you can buy this, but it's only going to have the uh, first game. Uh, they're going to roll in the uh, uh, Destiny Knight Destiny Knight and the Thief of Fate later on uh, included there. Uh, they've also made it possible for, to play as a male or female uh, across <laughs> all three of these games. Uh, so that's kind of cool. You know, I could have sworn they had that option in some of those, but maybe I'm, you know, misremembering. I'm <laughs> getting old here. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's pretty cool. Uh, so uh, there you go. Bard's Tell Trilogy. All right. Uh, well, that's done. <laughs> uh, what about that ale of the week? Well, this week I got a little number. found this on sale. Uh, you know, a lot of times I'm not going to spend like $30, $40 <laughs> on an ale. You know, I just don't have that kind of money. Uh, but every now and then I'll see one marked down, and that's the case here. And so I thought, you know what the heck, go ahead, try it out. Uh, see, what, see how the other half lives, maybe. Uh, but this is a triple burner. Uh, from the uh, Brooklyn Brewery out of, of course, Brooklyn. Uh, go figure on that. And it's a Belgian-style triple ale brewed with licorice spices, which I know a lot of people hate licorice. I happen to like the flavor. <laughs> so, that was it, that, that, that spice they put in there. It's like, um, always mess up the name. I, I want to say it's like anise or anise. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. Uh, reason that's so confusing to me, just a quick aside, uh, I had a good, one of my favorite students was named uh, Anise, and I was always getting him confused with <laughs> the licorice spice, and he'd correct me, and then I'd kind of feel embarrassed about it, so now I'm just like, oh, oh my God, I don't even want to, uh, I don't even want to try to pronounce it. <laughs> I guess I don't have to worry about offending the spice, but uh, anyway. Okay, so it's got that in it. It's brewed in the aged, um, or it's aged in a white wine barrel. So we've got the licorice spices mixed in with that uh, white wine barrel. And oh, there's a little bit on the back here too. Let's see, according to ancient Chinese beliefs, the triple burner was responsible for the flow of energy throughout the body. <laughs> oh, I did not know that. I didn't even know, I didn't even think about the title. Uh, triple burner tonics often included licorice root to encourage, quote, natural sweetness and a light, joyful presence. Uh, white wine barrels, licorice spice blend, blend from the wizard Lear Lev uh, Sirkars, and a robust triple base creates triple burner. Heady rom aromatic ale to be paired with a state of serenity. Okay, so I must be serene as we indulge ourselves in the triple burner. I'm already feeling the uh, the health benefits of this. <laughs> Ale, it's like a, it's emanating from the bottle through my hand, through my arms. I'm feeling enlightened. <laughs> anyway, let's get this son of a gun open. You know, the good news is we do have the fancy cork top on this. So let's get this thing open before I get over enlightened. And uh, I'll see if I can hit you with a, with a cork. Remember, folks, do not... You know, I'm kind of afraid to do it, but, you know, don't do that. <laughs> you know, don't look at the cork. Uh, these things do tend to shoot out with force. And uh, you can have a lot of fun with your friends, though, trying to shoot them with the corks of these. It's uh, almost as much fun as drinking the ale. You know, especially if you can catch them uh, by surprise with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding around, guys. Uh, probably uh, somebody will probably try that and get me try to blame it on me, right? <clears throat> All right. I think we were good to go. You know, I really think they need to put sights on these bottles to help you with this part of it. But come on, there we go. We're going to loosen up a little bit. And let's see, can he do it? All right, come on, there we go, there we go, there we go. That's coming this time. Woo! <laughs> good God, did you see how... Man, that thing was like a, a freaking shotgun slug come out of this bottle. I'm kind of glad I missed. I think it went boom. Oh, wow. Anyway, 
Uh, let me uh, get this into the drinking horn and uh, I'll tell you all about it. All right, I'm still recovering from the shock of the opening this uh, triple burner, but... Ah, it smells so good. You know, it almost... Uh, what are they... Let's say licorice spice? It doesn't really smell like... Uh, uh, licorice so much. It's just a real strong citrusy, like a champagne aroma on it. You know, I don't know if I'm going crazy here, but I can... It's like I swear I could smell kind of a pumpkin uh, spice in there somewhere. Anyway, it uh, definitely uh, <laughs> smells good. Yeah, that's a really, really good aroma on this one. Uh, I don't know if you can hear it. I guess you probably can't hear this, but this is like a, a real fizzy. It's like... <laughs> it's very, very active uh, uh, beverage. I guess it's all that uh, uh, enlightenment in the uh, <laughs> in the mix here. But let's uh, give it a go. Wow, yeah, this has got a, <coughs> a lot of flavor. Uh, again, I'm not really tasting anything I'd call licorice. Uh, it's, I definitely taste that sort of triple flavor, kind of that peachy. Uh, uh, maybe a little bit of a, yeah, you know, I, I don't know why, but I'm definitely smelling and tasting like kind of a pumpkin-like flavor to this. That sort of pumpkin pie spice. It's not, it's not overpowering or anything. Uh, it just makes it a little more interesting on on the back end. Uh, uh, it's very thick, very creamy, and uh, very sweet. I'll try it again. Yeah, this is good stuff. Um, uh, you can definitely taste there's some alcohol in there. Uh, I wanted to say it was something like 10 and 10 percent, something like that. So a little bit on on the high end there, but uh, you know, still very, very uh, uh, good tasting. Uh, I'll try it one more time here, but I think I know where this is going. Mm. Yeah, just a, a super, super good ale. A uh, really smooth, really sweet. It's got an interesting, uh, complicated uh, finish on it. Uh, I like the, uh, the the activity of it. It's very, you know, alive when you pour it in there. And I think you'd have fun with your friends uh, talking about the triple burner aspect of this and the whole Chinese uh, connection. It's kind of cool. Uh, but anyway, it's a, I don't find any fault at all with this. Uh, very interesting uh, combinations. A lot of flavor. Very uh, thick and creamy. And I think you'd like it. So I'm going to go full uh, five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, the triple burner from the uh, Brooklyn Brewery. You know, I haven't really been disappointed with those guys yet, so it's, it's definitely, you know, if you see that label, <laughs> you're probably in pretty good hands. But uh, definitely with this triple burner, uh, five out of five. All right, so I was looking for quotes about candles, you know, since the game was the magic candle. And uh, I just sort of picked one uh, that looked good. But uh, in retrospect, it's kind of weird that I would pick this uh, quote, <laughs> considering uh, that I had that ale, because it's from the Buddha. Uh, anyway, I think it's a really cool quote. It goes something like this. And I also think it's appropriate for uh, the magic candle, the sort of things we've been talking about with the uh, Ultima likes. You know, is, is it a clone? Is it, a, uh, is it an homage? You know, what, how do you uh, sort of get at that? Uh, I think this quote is actually very relevant here. Anyway, I've gone on enough. <laughs> Let's see how long I can drag this section out. Uh, now, here, here goes the quote. Uh, thousands of candles can be lighted from a single candle, and the life of that single candle will not be shortened. Happiness never decreases by being shared. A wonderful sentiment there. Uh, so ponder on that, and see you guys next time.
I want that circuit film. It says made in Japan. What do you mean, Doc? All that stuff is made in Japan. Unbelievable.